Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Thank Hi, you, Karen. Chase. I was Good hoping morning. you would do that. <clears throat> if, um, if you don't know about the little page called Tidbits, this is uh, a feedback to me. So I really would like for you, if you would, to get a, a Tidbit page every once in a while or once a week and uh, let me know what you're learning if you like the direction we're going. It, I really do need feedback. Uh, so if you need a tidbit paper, um, if you would just raise your hand and who would like to hand out tidbit papers? Anybody need it? Would you, Carol? Thank you. So just raise your hand and Carol can give you a tidbit because, a tidbit page, because it's helpful to me and I, uh, helps us remember what all we've been learning too. I just heard Chase. Wave at me, Chase. Right back there's Chase with Lyndon. Chase, I heard from somebody this week that is a member of our class, but they're somewhat homebound right now. And they've been listening to your uh, YouTube of our lessons. And she's been really blessed. So I just wanted to tell Chase thank you as thank well. Thank you, Chase. Yeah. yeah, today we are going to look at uh, the seven seals of, of Revelation chapter 6. And here's what I would want us to remember. These are scary. This is a scary part of the Bible. And I've really been kind of suffering this week, wondering if this is what we really need to be spending our time on. But then I realized that Jesus took a whole lot of time revealing this to John, the revelator, and we have it, have it in our book, so we need to spend time on that. But here's what I also want you to know. Jesus said, when you start seeing some of these things beginning to happen, don't be alarmed. Why? Because they're just the beginning of the time of the end. And so we are to keep our eyes on the Lord. And when we see these things happening, we are to get ourselves closer to God and praise Him because... We don't have to go through this. But we will see the beginning of the end. Look, please, at your newsletter. By the way, we are on page today, 182. Uh, we had it last week. We did the first part of page 182. We're going to finish it today. And then next week we will have page 183. So if you have last week's, we started it. If you don't, be sure and get you a new one. Please look at your newsletter at the very, very bottom. Elizabeth, happy anniversary to you and Jerry. How many years for you? Eleven? Oh, that is awesome. That's so great. They were coming to this class, both of them, before they even started dating. And then they just, it was fun to watch you guys. It was fun. So, um, and then Elizabeth's birthday was, it's this week, isn't it? And Jessica, did I see Jessica come in? Happy birthday, Jessica. Um, so let's just look at the bottom of the paper where it says our current unit of study. We are studying the seven seals. We studied a couple of weeks ago, well last week we studied, where the, that uh, scroll with the seals on it, where might it have come from? Who wrote the scroll? and sealed it. Who remembers? Jesus Christ. No. No, no, no. Really. No, 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 no. Daniel. Who? <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you're here, Jamel. Daniel. Daniel. Look Daniel. at last week's lesson. In Daniel chapter 12, he was writing all of the vision that God gave him. And he said, now Daniel, <coughs> seal it. Roll it up and seal it. It will be opened at the time of the end. And it was given again to John to see and Jesus opened it at the time of the end. So the time of the end began way back when, when the uh, grace of age began. This is the time of the end and the time of the end also means... What did I say? Grace of age. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad I have you. Yeah, the grace of the, the age of grace is the time of the end. I think we may not have it. 
No, we have to have a computer. You're gonna have to wing it, Mom. I think the, I think the devil's got a hold of it. So, um, this, this are the, these are the seven seals that were probably rolled up by Daniel, and then it was opened by Jesus uh, when John had this vision. The first four seals. By the way, these seven seals occur. The events of these seals occur in the first three and one half years of the tribulation. This is Daniel's 70th week that we studied. Daniel's 70th week or the tribulation begins when the Antichrist appears and makes this covenant with Israel to protect Israel from her enemies, right? That covenant. And at that same time, we see that the seven seals, the seven judgments, begin to occur. So the first four seals are the uh, four horses of the apocalypse. How many of you looked in the on uh, Google this week and looked up the four horses of the apocalypse in our culture today? <clears throat> if you didn't listen to last week's lesson, be sure and do that. It's really good. Um, and, and the four horses of the apocalypse have really been abused and misused through the years, because what it is doing, I think, is diluting the power of the book of Revelation. It's diluting the scriptures and making light of the four horses of the apocalypse, which is nothing, nothing light. <coughs> and so the four horses, and we'll look at the first one and the second one last week. We looked at, we're going to look at the third and the fourth horses today. The white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. The fifth seal is the souls of the martyrs. In the scriptures, it's called the cry of the martyrs. And we're going to look at that next week. And the sixth and seventh are the great earthquake and silence. And so we will study those next week. So I don't know how to teach without my overhead. So we'll just start here, okay? You got it, guys? We don't need sound, just picture. Isn't that amazing? At one time we didn't understand it, and now we can't do without it. Yeah, I, know. I know. Okay, I don't even have my clicker. You have my clicker? I know. I spent hours on this thing. So let's just pretend I have it, okay? And I missed five meals on this. He did. He did. Look at page 181 and let's look at the first seals. Page 181 and uh, I hope I have it. Here we go. That will be Roman numeral 2 on page 181. It's the um, white horse. So I'm going to read and if you would just, this is not good either. Is this too loud? Yes. It's too loud, honey. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. We learned in chapter 5. Is that better? Okay. We learned in chapter 5 of Revelation that Jesus is the only one worthy to open those seals. If you look at chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, it, it presents him as the creator. So we know he is worthy to open the seals because he is the creator. Chapter 6, I mean chapter 5 tells us he is the redeemer and thus he is worthy to open the seals. So let's look at chapter 6 of Revelation at the first seal. All right, I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Who's the lamb, everybody? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Then I heard one of the four living creatures. We learned in our lessons that the four living creatures are angelic creatures. They said in a voice like thunder, Come. We learned last week that that really should be translated. Go. Go. He's speaking to a horse and its rider, not to John. And so this voice says, Come. Verse 2, I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow. When a rider comes in on a white horse, generally that rider in the Roman culture was a, a, a conqueror. 
Whenever a general conquered a town or a nation, he would come in on a white horse, and that's exactly what this is presenting. So he comes in as a conqueror holding a bow, but he is not holding what with the bow? No arrows. No arrows, meaning he's coming as a conqueror, but he's also coming in peace. All right? And then it says he was given a crown. And in the Greek... Wow. Okay, what, honey? Okay, well, go down next, next, next. Keep going. Keep going. There's the four horses. Keep going. Honey, just keep going. Next. Okay, good. Mac. <laughs> Here are the four horses. And if you look at them, the first one is the white horse. And he's coming with a bow. Why don't you turn the lights off for a minute, Doug, so that we can see this. Are you telling me that my pointer isn't working either? Oh, no, let's the, turn it the other way. The Don't even try it, honey. Just say next. Okay. All right, the horse, white horse, coming with a bow, and he is wearing a crown. In the Greek, this crown means the conqueror's crown because he has conquered. And so that's the first horse. We're going to look at the second horse. It is a red horse. We learned that the red horse represents war, the shedding of blood. We're going to look at the third horse today. That's the black horse. Whenever you see somebody wearing black as their as their clothes for a long while, it usually means mourning, doesn't it? M-O-U-R-N, to mourn. It's the clothing of a mourner. So he's wearing black because the rider on this horse is death. And following behind death is another horse, not this fourth horse, but following very, very closely behind death on the black horse, you will see uh, Hades. Hades is another name in the Bible for the, for the cemetery, for burial, the, just dumped in the hole. That's what Hades is. He's the grave digger. So we have, we have death and Hades riding together on two horses together. And then the last horse, the fourth horse, is the pale horse. And it is called the green horse. Thank you, Cheryl. And it's the color of a dead corpse, of a corrupting corpse, because it's representing um, death. Okay, so let's go, Lyndon. So the first seal is the white horse. Keep going. Just keep going down. I watched as the lamb, Jesus Christ, the crucified one. Keep going, baby. Opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures. Who are the four living creatures? Angelic beings. <clears throat> Say in a voice like thunder, come. And what did we say come should be? Go. go. In fact, in the Greek word, it is the same. Come and go is the same, very similar Greek word. So they look at it in its context. Yes? This morning, the Holy Spirit gave me something on the four living creatures. Okay. They tie to what you're t talking about. Each one, why was, why did God use those? Four why did why he did use he, the four angelic creatures to call the horses? Why did they, he? Uh -huh. they, they each one, the first, and it says the second one, the third one, fourth one. Each one of them has a different face. The face go has a meaning to the horse and the rider and everything. Huh. I don't know what it means, but okay, that's keep studying that because these four creatures have different faces, and they represent the color of the horse and its rider. <laughs> Oh, there's so much in the Bible. Thank you, Jamel. Thank you, Lord. Keep studying on that and give it to us, all righty? All right, so he said in a voice like thunder, come. <clears throat> Keep going, baby. Keep. Next. <laughs> Next. I looked and there before me, this is not going to work. There before me was a white horse. And white signifies judgment and warfare. Its rider held a bow, but had no arrows, meaning he comes how? Peace. In peace. Keep going. And he was given a crown, and it was the conqueror's crown. 
and he, may, he wrote out as a conqueror or bent on conquest. Who did we decide last week this rider on the white horse represents? The Antichrist. Jesus comes in on a white horse in chapter 19. But you and I studied last week and contrasted the riders on the two white horses. This first one is the Antichrist because he comes at the beginning of judgment. Jesus Christ comes on a white horse at the end of judgment. They're wearing different crowns. They're carrying different weapons. And, and so this one is the Antichrist. At the beginning of the tribulation, go ahead, babe. The Antichrist will come in the name of world peace and unity on this horse. He's coming in representing peace. And that's when he makes his covenant with Israel. All right. And so he's going to engineer this treaty. And the world is going to celebrate this peace. And Israel will do away with all their military armaments. They will do it because they're going to be living in peace. The Antichrist says we will protect you from your enemies. So they do away with their army and their military and their armaments and they're going to start building what? The temple. The, temple, the third temple. But it's a false peace and it's short lived and yes, bless your heart. Try left clicking it. Left clicking. This clicker? Yeah. This side? Uh, what? Like just hold it kind of like that and then... Okay, go. hold it. All right. So let's see if this video will work. Remember when we used to watch the Miss America pageants, girls, when we were little? And every time they would interview one of the girls, they would say, what do you think you would do? Or what was the most important thing in the world that we have? What is it? World, world, world peace. peace. Let's see if my video works. Please, Lord, let it work. Lights. World Peace. Definitely world peace. That's easy. World peace. World peace. What is the one most important thing our society needs? That would be harsher punishment for a parole violator, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> and world peace. Uh. Okay, I thought you would enjoy that. So now then, uh, the second seal. So the first one is the white, the rider on the white horse, bringing he says world peace, representing the Antichrist. It is a false world peace. And so the second horse comes in, Revelation chapter six, verses three and four. Look in your Bibles or. Here, when the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, which it should be what? Go. Go. And another horse came out. And thank you, Chase, wherever you are. Thank you, Lyndon, wherever you are. Man, you guys are good. A fiery red horse came out. Its rider was given power to do what? Take peace. Take peace from the hort, from the earth, and to make people kill each other. In the Greek, again, in the context of the Greek, it's not only just kingdom against kingdom, but it's a nation against itself. Civil war, one of the worst kinds of war. To him was given a large sword. So this red horse on page 181 represents, the red horse uh, represents war. And generally, it always represents war and the shedding of blood. And the rider carries a large sword. And what this is reminding John's readers, remember this was in 96 AD, that this book was written in about 90 to 96 AD. And John's readers were reading this and they recognized that a white horse represents judgment and that this red horse and its rider carrying a large sword reminds the readers of the Roman soldiers. When they come in to battle, they carry this sword. And when they go out to conquer nations, 
nations, they carry this huge sword. So this red horse is representing war. He is given power to take peace from the earth. And remember last week we looked at just at the wars in the United States since, since the war of the French and Indian War, way back in the 1600s. We have had war after war after war. That is even how we describe American history and how the writers write history books, by dividing it between or among the war, by the wars. And so here this man, this writer, is given power to take peace. How is peace taken from the earth? By war, isn't it? So it's nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now that's the first and second seals. We went through it really, really quickly. I did it last week, so just go online and look for that and I'll help you if you can't find it. This week we're on page 182 and we're looking at the, pe the third seal. And so let's look at Revelation chapter 6 verses... Um, 5 and 6. This is page 182, letter C, right? Yes, ma'am. The third seal. And there you have the picture of the uh, four horses of the apocalypse, of the black horse, and he's carrying scales. And he looks like a skeleton, doesn't he? So let's read what this is all about. Are we supposed to, are we supposed to be frightened as we read this? No. no why not? We won't be here. We won't be here. So there's another reason why God thinks it's so important that he revealed this to us. Let's think about that. Here's the black horse. When the lamb, who's the lamb? Jesus. Opened the third seal. I heard the third living creature. There you go. I didn't even notice that, Jamel. It's the third living creature saying, come or go. That's interesting. Um, I looked. Who is I? Oh, John. John, the John the Revelator, John the disciple of Jesus, John one of the sons of thunder, uh, John the apostle whom Jesus loved. That's how he identified himself. But he was one of the sons of thunder that the children studied in Bible school this week. So it's John said, I looked and there before me was what kind of a horse? A black horse and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand or a balance and they use these scales in the marketplace don't they and then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures and it said two quarts of wheat for a day's wage and six quarts of barley for a day's wage wages and do not damage the oil and the wine so what they're saying is here Two quarts of wheat is about what one person would eat. They were pretty much of a, of a bread-eating society. And so it took two quarts of wheat for one person, and it cost them a whole day's wage to feed a meal to one person. What happens if you only get one meal a day? You're pretty hungry, aren't you? And you only have enough as the wage earner to purchase one meal. So you divide it among your family. The black horse. Black often represents what? Death. Death. When we wear the mourner's clothes. And this is on number one on letter C. The black horse represents death. The black horse is connected with this. It's connected with famine. Famine generally follows war. When you look at the South African countries and the South American countries and the Oriental countries, when there is civil war and when there is war, generally the food industry, it's destroyed, isn't it? And famine occurs. So with famine always comes starvation. And with starvation and famine, when you weaken a person's body, what comes next? Disease. And then, so it's famine, starvation, and disease. That's what this black horse is connected with. Now that scares me really bad if I thought I was going to have to live through this. Wouldn't it you? Hi, Aaron. Mm -hmm. We're glad you're here. These events, these events, starvation, famine, and disease, follow what? 
War. War. And that's number two, uh, letter B. Now let's, I'm going to have us look at Lamentations chapter 4. Lamentations is the book right after the book of Jeremiah. In the book of Jeremiah, the prophet is telling the people to repent or Babylon is going to come in. And it took uh, 50 some chapters for, De for Jeremiah to, to tell the people to do this. And all they did was throw rocks at him, throw him in a water cistern, put him into all kinds of prisons and, and, and they totally miss it. They abused this prophet and sure enough Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm gonna, if I had a sticker, I'd give it to you. Who remembers what year Babylon was destroyed? I mean, Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon. Who remembers? <laughs> Write it down. 586 B.C. 586 years before Christ, the first temple, the Solomon's temple, was destroyed. And Jeremiah had been telling them it was going to happen. And the people said it can't happen. Jerusalem is God's holy city. And we know the temple can't be destroyed because it's the place of residence. It's where God resides. It's where his glory is. But it was destroyed because of their sin. And then Jeremiah writes the next book called Lamentations. Lamentations, the base word, is to lament, to cry, to mourn. Just as this black horse, mourning. And so listen to what he says about the people in Jerusalem following its destruction. He says in verse 8 of chapter 4. Now they, and if you look back up, you'll see that they is referring to the nobility. The, the princes and the princes says are blacker than soot because of the fire. So they're black. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. As, as uh, it has become as dry as a stick. This is what starvation does to people. The bones shrivel and you become as a dry. Um, let's see. There we go. Those killed, according to Jeremiah, those killed by the sword are better off than those who die of famine. It's less painful. They are racked with hunger. They waste away for lack of food from the field. This is a description of what it will be during the tribulation when famine comes, when disease comes. So that's page 182, letter C, number 1. Okay? Now let's look at the rider. Anybody need help with number 1? Okay. Uh, and be sure that you mark Lamentations 4 in your book to read that and understand the, the text of that, the context. All right, now let's look at the rider. He carried a pair of scales in his hand representing the marketplace because that's where they're going to go buy their groceries. And we're going to find that a day's wage will pay for one meal, for one person, for one day. That is living on the edge. In fact, that's living below subsistence level. You could not sustain yourself on this kind of uh, food. And it's called hyperinflation. We know about hyperinflation. Alrighty, that's number two. So, where is mercy? We think, where is God's mercy? Is there any mercy in this judgment? What is, where would we find God's mercy? I mean, the people are dying of starvation and disease. Well, the writer is told, do not damage the oil and the wine. Now, what, how could we find mercy in that? Well, how long does it take to grow wheat and barley? Just a growing season, right? So the wheat and the barley are destroyed because it can be replaced in another growing season. But when you think about oil and wine, oil comes from trees. 
olive trees. It takes years for an olive tree to, pre to, to give olives that you could produce uh, oil with. And what about the wine? What's it grow from? Grapes. It takes years to grow these grape vines to produce the wine. So, it ta so this is where the mercy is because only what is being destroyed at this point in time is just those crops that can be replaced next year or the next growing season. And so the writer is told not to damage the oil and the wine. Isn't that interesting? Now, um, when you think about this, in a famine, who's going to get the food first? The rich. the rich. So the rich will be ones getting the oil and the wine. And the poor will be dying of starvation very quickly. So that's um, C number two. Let's look at that. Letter C number two. What does the writer carry? A pair of what? Scales or a balance representing the marketplace. In the tribulation period, a day's wage will pay for one, for one, for one. And only the very what? Rich will have the staples of oil and wine. Now let's see about this. During this tribulation, who is going to be able to buy and sell? Because it's going to become, as Pastor Rob told us, a cashless society. And, and remember when Robbie was preaching about this just a couple of weeks ago? He was talking about the cashless society during the tribulation and how that concept is already coming into being, isn't it? And so uh, I, I, I don't carry cash much anymore. I don't because Lyndon does. So, but um, he gave me a card. So I don't, if I needed cash, I just use my card. And so let's look at this. Who will be able to, oh, who will be able to buy and sell? Now look at chapter 13. It tells us who will be able to buy and sell during the tribulation. And, and I think, and I think even we're seeing something like this. I don't know. But something like this could be occurring in New York City right now. Because New York City has a rule right now that says unless you can prove that you have been vaccinated, you cannot ride a train into New York City and you cannot go to work and you cannot go to restaurants and you can go to the tiny marketplaces, but that's it. And so we can even see now that is just a sign of the beginning of this. And Jesus said, don't worry, don't be alarmed. But it, is a, but it is a foretaste of what's going to happen here. Let's see how this will work. All people, and that is all people without exception. The great people and the small people, the rich and the poor, the free and the slave were forced to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. And, what, and why? And we call that, by the way, what do we call that mark on their right hand or on their forehead? The mark of the beast. And they would not, why did they require them to do it? Why are they forced to do it? So that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Later in the scriptures it tells us that you could not receive that mark unless you said that you would be loyal to the Antichrist. So if you are going to be loyal to God and loyal to his word and to your testimony of the message of Jesus Christ, you don't get the mark of the beast. Therefore you do not what? Eat. Eat. Buy and sell. In the King James it doesn't say on forehead or on okay. the right hand it says in. In. Does it say in? It says in. It's very important. <laughs> Ooh, it is very important. It says in. It really? Yeah. Oh my. Okay. The way you think. Pardon? It's in your mind the way you think. Well no it's going to be an actual physical thing. Oh. A mark. Yeah, okay. Well it could be a chip. We don't know what it's going to be. It could be something. But it, you said it's in, in the Greek. In the King James? In the King James. 
Okay, so I'll have to go back to my Greek and check that out. Thank you. Thank you. That's really interesting. So this is the mark of the beast. Only those who have it will be able to buy and sell. The Antichrist will be using famine to get people to be allegiant to him. Right? And if you want to eat, you will pledge allegiance to the Antichrist. Then you will get the mark of the beast. And then you will not be redeemed by Jesus Christ. It's going to be a terrible time. So if we really, really, really don't want to go through that, then we must examine ourselves and make sure we are ready so that when Jesus appears in the sky to call his church home, he will be calling your name. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Okay, oh, come on. All right, I don't know what I went. Let's see, do I, uh, who will be able to buy and sell letter D? Only those with what? The mark of the beast. The beast in the book of Gen Revelation is the Antichrist. Listen carefully. When you read about the beast, the beast is the Antichrist. The mark of the beast is the mark of the Antichrist. Whatever they decide it will be. But it will be his name of some form. Letter B, the Antichrist will use what? To get people's allegiance. But the, it's even more interesting, not only their allegiance, but their worship. They will be required to worship the beast. And he will have his image in the temple. It's called the abomination that causes desol desolation. Number four, do we see the beginning of worldwide famine today? Yes. We do? How do we see the beginning of worldwide famine? Well, we've seen it on the news. Okay. And um, it's really not worldwide yet. Yeah, worldwide, but it is, there is famine going on. Yes, there? there's lots of famine going on. Like you said, it's not worldwide. Okay. We have famine going on even in the United States. And what, when we see famine, it is a foretaste of what? The tribulation. tribulation. And the tribulation will be worldwide famine. And I looked it up. What does it mean to starve? What's it feel like? It's a gnawing, clawing, painful sensation every minute. You know what? I look at my little dog and I, and I see how, how vulnerable he is and how dependent my little dog is on me. And he expects me to feed him. And I think, what? How bad would it be not to have food to give my little dog? How bad would it be not to give food to your children or to your spouse? I can't imagine how hard it will be. But it's a gnawing, clawing, painful sensation. Today, we see stricken areas, poverty-stricken areas around the world. We see children, we see adults, we see animals starving. 124 million people in 51 countries face the crisis of a food shortage every day. We need to be so thankful. This crisis is usually due to war. Kevin. That's exactly it. That it's usually due to conflict, war, but more importantly, it's usually due to people doing exactly what the Antichrist will do and, and uh, withholding food from their people as a means of controlling them. Which, by the way, is when you control and manipulate somebody, that is a form of witchcraft. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so Kevin says, exactly what I'm going to say, is that corrupt governments will manipulate and control their people by way of food. Yes, David. Thank you, Kevin. Just to bring a little more home, uh, they say that Bill Gates is buying uh, several thousand farms in America. And supposedly for organic farming. Yeah. It would be interesting if he had control of all yeah. the farming. And I hear that Bill Gates not only buying those farms, he's also buying up a lot of the cattle ranches because uh, he wants to get rid of well, I don't know, this, this may be just one of those stories, but, you know, when you, when you own it all, you control it, don't you? So, don't be alarmed. Why? Because this is only a foretaste of what's to come. And Jesus said he'll come and get you before it gets this far. So, what about the ever-increasing number of people in the population? Do you know how long it took for the world to gain a billion people? 
from the time God created Adam and Eve until we reached a billion people 6,000 years. All right, watch this. Um, population milestones. Approximately 6,000 years for our population in the whole earth to reach 1 billion. And that was in 1804. Isn't that amazing? Then just 123 years later, we reached 2 billion. It was 6,000 years to reach 1. Only took 123 years to reach 2. How many years do you think it, will take, it took to reach 3? 33 years in 1960. When did we reach 4 billion? In 1974. Just 14 years. And then we got to 5 billion 13 years later. And then 6 billion 12 years later. 7 billion 12 years later. Now, today, 2021, it's only 10 years, and we're at 7.8 billion. We'll probably reach the 8 billion in uh, 12 years. Okay? Two more years. Now, when a world does that, what, and do you see all the farming and all the farmland in Mustang? What's happening to our farmland in Mustang? Houses. Houses. I just, it just hurts me to see that. But I'm going to say, don't be afraid. Don't be alarmed, Kevin. I've seen studies that show, uh, I mean, you hear this from, from the uh, national news and from the Democrats, the people who want to push us toward one world government and the people who are scared of the of population. Yes. Us. Now, I grew up in the bush of Central Africa. I like being away from the city. I don't like cities. But the bottom line is God told us something in the beginning in the very beginning, what was his first commandment? Repopul or populate. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Okay. There is more wilderness in the United States than there is anywhere else in the world. Right. You know that? Right. Uh, there's a plenty of farmland, plenty of resources on this world. And plenty of scientific knowledge. If we manage it properly. That's right. To to. A lot more than we'll ever see in our life. I think you're exactly right. We can feed the world. We can. We can feed our people. But again, if it's a corrupt government, if it's a, a, a government that wants to manipulate its people, yeah. if, yeah. if <laughs> okay, yeah. it's just interesting. The population has quadrupled in the last 100 years. And so that is letter C, number four. Do we see any signs today of a future worldwide fa famine? And Fox News said the population, well, you can see it right here, in the last 100 years has quadrupled. All right, so that's the third seal. Let's look at the fourth horse, the fourth apocalyptic horse. So thank you for your feedback, by the way. It's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, here's the fourth horse. Now, these are the apocalyptic horses. The fourth seal is the fourth horse. It's called the pale horse. It's also in, was it, which translation, Cheryl, did you show me that it did say green? In the Greek. Okay. Chlorophyll. Chloros. Chlorophyll. All that. Yeah. Okay. Called the green horse. It's also called the ashen horse. A S H. Um, when the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come, but what should it be translated? Go. Oh, y'all are so good. Go. I looked, John looked, and there before me was a pale horse. And uh, its rider was named Death. Ooh, isn't that terrible? The horse's name was Death. And following close behind him was Hades. Hades is the word for grave. When you think of Hades, it's the grave. It isn't hell. A lot of people think Hades and hell are the same. Hades means the grave. So we have death coming and then following close behind him is the grave digger, Hades. Um, if the writer was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth. A fourth is how, what's the percentage meaning a fourth? 25% of the earth to kill. So death 
is taking is going to kill 25% of the people on the earth by the sword which means what if you die by the sword what does that mean war dying by the sword means war famine dying by famine which would be starvation and third by plague which is diseases and the fourth one is by the wild beasts of the earth so the this horse will be responsible for 25 percent of the people being killed by war by starvation by plague and the wild beasts of the earth all right the pale number one at the bottom it's the pale horse you can call it the ashen horse you can call it the green horse um, yellow it's the yellowish green of decomposition it is the color of the face of a de decomposed corpse this is not a pretty horse the rider of the pale horse is named what death, death. he's also in the literature called the grim reaper right and following death is the gravedigger called what's his name Hades. Hades remember Hades is not hell it means the grave so he was followed closely by this next horse letter C death and Hades are responsible for the deaths of the fourth of the people in the wake of war starvation disease and finally what are the wild beasts we understand war we understand famine we understand plagues. What are the wild beasts that will be killing people? Bears and lions? No. What it's implying is that these wild beasts are like rats. What do rats do? Carry the plague, don't they? Carry fleas, carry disease. It could also be uh, living organisms called what? Bacteria. Bacteria. Ooh, we know about this now, don't we? Even back in the time of John, they didn't know anything like this, did they? But this is what we know today, living organisms called bacteria. Bacteria is becoming more and more irresistant. No, resistant. Sorry about that. Irresistant means not resistant. Okay, I'm going to do it again. They are becoming more and more resistant to antibiotics. Our nurses know about this, don't you? Um, in fact, Fox News again told us, who's the doctor on Fox News? Can't remember his name. Fauci. No, not Dr. Fauci, uh, somebody else. Anyway, he just said a couple of weeks ago, he said, if you want to be scared, just let me tell you this, that there are 24 pandemic viruses ready right now to strike the world, for which we do not have uh, vaccinations or antibodies. Okay, let's just go home now and celebrate, right? <laughs> Uh, death in Hades. War, famine, and plague will account for the 25% of the deaths of the world's population during the first three and a half years. And uh, I should have put there the wild animals, rats. Look at this. Um, what are the events in our day foreshadowing the pale horse? Well, <laughs> does, does it remind you of anything we're dealing with today? Of course. We see war and famine wreaking havoc in many countries of the world. We're seeing worldwide pestilences and diseases. We call them pandemics. Pan means worldwide, demic. AIDS killed 35 million people since the 60s. Uh, COVID has killed 4.6 million in the last two years. Rats, these wild beasts, carry 35 known diseases. They come in on ships all the time, don't they? That's how we got the plague back in the 1500s in Europe. And disease organisms can even be shipped from one country to another overnight, right? And diseases are becoming resistant to antibiotics. But don't be alarmed. <laughs> Isn't that funny? 
What did Jesus say? But don't be alarmed. Why? First of all, because these are just a foretaste of what's to come. Second of all, he said they can kill your body, but they cannot kill you. Alright? And so we need to thank God every day for our protection, our redemption. What does he want us to learn from the four horses of the apocalypse? If we're, if we're, if we're not going to be involved in it, what are we to do? Do we take it lightly? Do we make fun and name our dogs after the four horses of the apocalypse or our children? No. What do we, we cannot take this lightly. We should pray for our lost friends and family. We should tell them how they can avoid the apocalypse. We praise God that we've been saved from this wrath to come because look what it says in the scriptures in Revelation. Jesus is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why? Because he was slain. Look at this. And he, with his blood, he purchased for God persons from every tribe, every language, every people, and creation. Listen, we can study this, we can become very dramatic about it, but we have to remember that we've been redeemed. We have been purchased by the blood of the slain lamb. And so while we're stopping right now, I'm hoping my computer will work. Lyndon, I've got a song here. We're just going to sing, Redeemed by the blood of whom? The lamb. The lamb. Lights, please. And let's pray for our children. What did I do? <sighs> Listen. This week, people are going to tell you that the time of the end is near. And you ask them how they know. But I agree with them. The time of the end is near. Because Jesus said... This is the foretaste of what's going to happen. We're seeing it today. Next week we're going to study the martyrs and you will be amazed at how what John prophesied in the book of Revelation could not have happened until the last 60 years. Isn't that amazing? It's just been the last 60 years that these things have begun to really happen. When they tell you that, you say, but don't be alarmed because I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's our hope today. All right, so listen. I know Jesus is coming soon. The time of the end is near. And you say, but don't be what? Alarmed because. It could be today. It could be today, but I don't have to be alarmed because. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We don't have to be as prayed. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And because of that, we don't have to go through the wrath that is to come. You promised us, us that. It's because of your blood that you purchased for your Father, me, that I don't have to be going through the wrath to come. But I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us stay strong in that message, even to the point of death. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Thank you for letting me be your teacher. Thank you, Tim.